of time and research and energy into certain topics that we find will be important for our business community as we go through this uh, COVID, COVID crisis. Um, uh, Mike McGorry is a um, part owner of ServPro and on the chamber board. And when um, his employee Robin came to us and said, we'd love to do something on are people prepared for um, what a healthy a cleaning and environment your office needs to be in, uh, we said, yes, we're getting closer to that timing and we wanna make sure that we give our members information on that. So um, Rob and I met last night or Zoomed last night and she showed me this amazing PowerPoint, which I know she put a lot of work into and a lot of research. So I wanna thank you in advance, um, Robin, for all your efforts on this. We will be sharing the PowerPoint after the Zoom meeting. We will email anyone who registered. Um, if you didn't register and you would like it, make sure that you email me. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, but um, so Robin, um, if you just want to introduce yourself and then uh, take it away. Great, thank you, Danielle. Uh, yes, my name is Robin Kalajesi. I'm the Director of Marketing at SurfPro of Upper Bucks as well as uh, two locations we have in Philadelphia, Germantown and Pennypack Bustleton. And today we're gonna to talk about novel coronavirus and specifically about your business's reopening. We are getting close to that point and I know a lot of people are very nervous. They're nervous about cleaning and they're nervous about what our new norm is going to be when we get there. So there's a lot of information in this presentation. Um, I, it will come in at probably about 50 minutes and then we'll open this up to questions. Um, yeah. On that note, if people have questions, um, feel free to put them in the, into the uh, chat, chat box. You'll be monitoring that, Danielle? I will do my, I will do my best. Mm -hmm. Insert legalese in there. Don't hold me responsible. No, I'm okay. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. So I'm gonna get right started um, and my screen's not changing. Did we not just do this and it worked fine? There it goes, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so real quick to show you what the table of contents are. We'll first do a quick review of what we do know about the virus and what we don't know. And then part one of the presentation is specific to the cleaning. We're gonna talk a little bit about employees versus professionals. We're gonna do a brief um, explanation of the difference of cleaning versus de decontaminating versus sanitizing. We will then delve into the CDC categorizations of understanding a CAT1, a CAT2, and a CAT3 of cleaning protocols. We're going to discuss proper equipment, chemicals, and PPE, and that's personal protective equipment. That's an acronym probably six months ago, nobody knew, but now everybody knows it. Uh, we will additionally talk a little bit about HVAC and whether that type of cleaning is necessary. And then I did an interview with Brian Yeekel, the plant manager over at Penn, St Penn Stainless. Um, he wanted to come on the call. I'm not, he might actually be on the call, but he didn't think he could make it. So we decided to record an interview that is in the presentation so you can all get kind of a first hand um, testimony on, you know, a local business that is our friend and neighbor. And then we'll go into part two, which is the post pandemic, our new norm. And this is for reopening your businesses and, you know, the difficult decisions that business owners are going to be faced with. And then we created a nice back to work guide. Uh, we will cover things like developing an infectious disease response plan, creating a six foot six foot social distancing workplace, uh, making adjustments to your touch points, directional movements and maps for all locations, signage and what that will look like, um, creating solid rules and also communicating those rules, and then flexibility in our new, new norm as I like to call it. So the first thing as we talk about what we know and what we don't know is this virus is so unknown and what we don't know what we don't know. We don't know definitively how to kill it or how to stop it from spreading. It is a brand new virus that has never been here before. So I, I, I've said this a couple times, we're all the guinea pigs. A year from now, 10 years from now, we are setting the precedent of how this virus is handled and 
whether it's vaccines or whatnot going forward. We don't know if it will continue to mutate if there will be emergence. Uh, I just heard yesterday that college football is probably going to be canceled for the fall season. So that just gives you an insight into how different our worlds are going to be moving forward. We don't know how many people are going to fall ill or how many people will die. Uh, as we stay in tune with news, we all see that we're still scrambling to have effective test results and proper uh, accounts being made. But uh, again, we're in an unknown world and we're doing the best that we can as a country to have a fit, um, the proper numbers. And we don't know how long it's actually going to last. You might all remember a uh, Two months ago when we were closing down for two weeks um, while we you know got our heads around this and next thing you knew we were closing down until May and schools were ending for the year and we still don't know exactly when life will go back to normal if it will ever go back to the normal that we've known. More of the, uh, the known unknown. So SARS-CoV-2 is an infectious virus that spreads, spreads easily through human contact. It needs a means to survive, which is a host. That's all of us. It has, needs possible means to survive, which are fomites. And that includes hard and soft surfaces, hair, clothing, plants, paper. There's also the potential of an airborne longevity that we are still unsure about. SARS-CoV-2 may remain viable for up to hours, up to 24 days on porous and non-porous surfaces. This is compared to the regular flu virus that is common to us, which only lives for one to three days. Um, they actually, the CDC did report a cruise ship that was locked down um, and empty for, I believe it was 17 days. And upon reopening, they did test it and it was still testing positive for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, this quote over here in this box, just so everybody does know that, that this research is coming in, in conjunction with the CDC, the EPA, um, all very uh, well-documented uh, sources. But again, I've highlighted there, um, it's just, there's so many unknowns about this virus that we are trying to work with. What we do know we do know SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. We do know that SARS-CoV-2 is the virus strain that causes coronavirus disease 2019, better known as COVID-19. I like to explain this because people think COVID-19 is the actual virus, and I compare it to something that people understand. The virus HIV is the cause of the disease AIDS. Here is the virus SARS-CoV-2, which causes the disease COVID-19. Uh, a lot of people, you know, the press and people just call it COVID-19 because I think it's easier to say and write than uh, SARS-CoV-2. We also know um, that it's an enveloped virus. And basically an enveloped virus, very simply saying, it means it's, it's covered in a lipid, a softer fat-like lipid membrane that is very sensitive to heat. Non-enveloped viruses um, do not have that bilayer membrane and is very heat resistant. Samples of enveloped viruses include the flu, influenza, influenza measles, HIV, and of course, SARS-CoV-2. Just to give you an example of some non-enveloped viruses would be the poliovirus and hepatitis A. And what this means, this is actually good to know. This is good news and this is what has helped lead us in the direction that we're in on how to clean. Um, but basically non-enveloped viruses, they actually proliferate rapidly in an acidic environment and they can survive in some disinfectants. Enveloped viruses, one, they cannot tolerate hot temperatures or an acidic environment, and they're very sensitive to very dry conditions. And this is why you might recall seeing a lot of um, videos online where people are explaining washing your hands and just that hot water, that the soap, and that reaction of actually scrubbing together is what helps break down that envelope that surrounds the virus. Um, this, this screen, I've been giving this presentation 
for well over a month now, back in the middle of March. And it amazes me how much I've updated it every time I give it because everything is being updated from the Department of Health, from the government, where every day where there's new mandates, there's new information coming out. So once again, I just re-updated this information as of yesterday. Um, please, what I encourage, I'm not going to read through all of this. Uh, the takeaway from this page is that it is mandated for businesses when they reopen that they have to have a written plan established an existing cleaning protocol in place. What I encourage every single business owner to do every day is go to governor.pa.gov, look this information up, see what the new mandates are to make sure that your business is compliant with the laws that are coming forward with reopening your business. So what does all this mean? The, what we know and what we don't know is, we do know that cleaning is our new norm. And that's what we're gonna get into now. Um, one of the unfortunate very real norms, <clears throat> which actually was brought to my attention earlier this week, and I just did a random Google search about lawsuits. Can employees sue you if they get sick? Well, obviously people can sue for whatever reason. Danielle even mentioned it at the beginning of this, please don't sue me. But um, it's very true. Uh, there, somebody on a call I was on yesterday um, out in Oklahoma, there's a, a chain similar to what we know as Wawa out there and an employee, a 21 year old employee who was charged with cleaning after hours um, wound up con getting the virus and uh, getting ill and then he, he actually passed from it and his family is doing because they say that he was not properly trained and he was not wearing the proper equipment. He was just wearing the gloves that they used in the food service area to prepare sandwiches. And um, it, you really need to consider these things when you're reopening your business. You have to protect yourself. You have to protect your employees and you have to protect your business. And like I said, I, I just did a Google of this and it's unfortunate that that's gonna be part of our new norm. Robin, if I could interject here just for a quick second. Absolutely. Um, I'm taking, I've been doing, um, taking a lot of online courses, certifications and whatnot. Um, I'm also an OSHA instructor and the main takeaway at this point would be um, the OSHA Act of 1970, the general duty clause the employer shall furnish to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to his employees. We also have the obligation of providing the proper PPE, personal protective equipment. With that said, employers, just so you feel a little bit more comfortable in going into this next phase, um, there's a part B to the general duty clause. The part B of the general duty clause says, each employee shall comply with occupational safety and health standards and all rules, regulations, and orders issued pursuant to this act, which are applicable to his own actions and conduct. So we have an obligation as employees to train in this new environment to provide them with what they need to show them how to wear it. And then it's their obligation to, to wear it properly and follow the rules properly. And I would recommend documenting everything that you do. Document it with each employee and have them sign it. Uh, video document if you're doing PPE training and we can help you with that. And that's, we're not gonna charge you for it. I wanna make sure that your employees are safe and, and wearing the PPE properly. I see people on and they only have the top done but the bottom's wide open, so it's doing them no good and it's doing us no good when they're wearing it that way. Check out at this point. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate that interjection. Um, I am going to talk really quick about the difference of using employees versus professionals uh, when it comes to cleaning your business prior to reopening. Um, keeping in mind, uh, this virus is capable of killing two to 5% of the people that it infects, and it's considered a biological threat, capable of immediate dangerous to, to life and health. And what that really means is the effects from exposure 
Um, it may be immediate, but it could also be delayed and have permanent adverse health effects. What that means is workers need to be properly trained. Like Mike just said, um, people need to know how to put PP on, how to take PP off, how to properly use chemicals that they might not be used to using. These are all things you need to be thinking about now before opening your doors. A little bit more on employees versus professionals. Questions to ask yourself, are your employees trained in infectious disease control protocol? Are your employees trained in proper chemical application and cleaning? Do your employees have the appropriate PPE gear? And again, are they trained in how to put it on and take it off? You must treat your facility as if if there has been identified case of COVID-19. And that's because of the dormancy rate of up to 14 days. I have read reports that it's even more than 14 days in some cases. That means the amount of people walking through your door, it just takes one person to walk through your door on, with no symptoms, but they're carrying the virus to cross contaminate your business. So you have to treat your business as if there has been a positive case already in there. So what this means is your, your employees need to have some level of the OSHA training that Mike talked about and has Whopper training. It's necessary. And this just adds that level of protection to you as the employer and the business owner that you followed the protocols necessary to ensure that you're doing everything safely and by the book according to OSHA standards. I'm going to talk briefly about different cleaning levels because it's important to understand them and how they work and what they actually do. And that's going to include general cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. General surface cleaning is just that. It's a bucket with water and detergent and physical scrubbing of the surface. General cleaning removes visible dirt, organic matter, viruses, fungi, and bacteria. It can remove microbes if possible, but it does not kill them. Most microbes cannot live on dry, clean surfaces. This is important when I get to the disinfecting so you understand what general cleaning means, but basically it's what we do in our houses. It's what we do every day with just general cleaning. Sanitizing reduces, but does not necessarily eliminate all the bacteria on treated surfaces. To be a registered sanitizer, you must show a reduction level of at least 99.9% .9 in the number of each type of bacteria tested on non-food contact surfaces. Some of those examples include carpet, carpet, air, laundry, toilet bowl. That's what sanitizers are made for, uh, which do not have any claims for viruses or fungi. Disinfecting. Disinfecting works by using chemicals to actually kill germs on surfaces. However, disinfecting does not necessarily remove germs or clean dirty surfaces. And this is why the general cleaning guide was so important because you have to generally clean prior to disinfecting. Disinfecting will not clean the surface, it just disinfects the surface. But it does destroy um, or irreversibly inactivates infectious microbes but it does not necessarily remove spores of bacteria or fungi. So we're gonna talk about the levels of COVID-19 cleaning. There's category one. Category one is considered proactive cleaning. We've been doing a lot of proactive cleaning for every type of business, big and small. We've done, this is us doing, I, I, Mike, you might remember, was that Penridge uh, Police? I'm sorry. I forget which it is. That, for it was that the Pen, it was the Penridge Police Department. It was that the, uh, did, patrol vehicles. Yes, we we've been doing a lot of fogging of fleet vehicles, um, everything from our first responders to tractor trailers um, for businesses. But proactive cleaning is just that. The place has been closed. We should have you know a proactive cleaning done. Cat two, category two, is where a person is under investigation or a PUI with possible exposure. That's the employee that says, oh, you know, my aunt uh, was at a dinner that I was at and then my cousin got sick, I'm feeling fine, but their doctor's gonna have them self-isolate for 14 days minimum um, because they are under investigation to see if they have been exposed to acquire the disease. 
and that cleaning, we'll get into the details of each of these cleanings in a second. CAT3 is considered a confirmed positive case. That's where, yes, my employee has tested positive and has COVID-19. That cleaning obviously is the, the top end of all of the cleanings combined. So CAT1 cleaning details for proactive. Um, the CDC encourages cleaning of the high touch hard surfaces. That includes countertops, tabletops, bathroom fixtures and toilets, keyboards, tablets, computers, doorknobs, phones, anything that people touch regularly. Um, again, this proactive cleaning is removing the soil and dirt that um, harbors the infectious agents while also disinfecting uh, the remaining environmental pathogens. Uh, cleaning is the first step, uh, and this is why these are kind of tiered to get to CAT3, but CAT1 cleaning happens with all categories. CAT2 cleaning, this is where I, I put in this clause about this is where your workers should be properly trained in OSHA and has power for bloodborne pathogen certifications. The presumptive cases with possible exposure to SARS-CoV-2 with people under investigation includes everything in CAT1, but also includes uh, cleaning and disinfecting non or high touch non-porous surfaces. Examples of this include drywall, carpeting, wallpaper, acoustic ceiling tiles, wood, all of those surfaces um, are included on CAT2 cleaning. CAT3 cleaning, the most detailed, is the enhanced cleanup. And just for the record, as we have kind of learned as we've been going for the past month and a half, we at ServPro, we kind of clump CAT2 and CAT3 together. If there's a possibility an employee has been exposed we are treating it as a cat free cleaning and just going straight to the, the top end there. Again, this is where we're, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt on the last two slides. I missed this when I did my review, but you have, it's just dyslexic. It says has power, but it should be has whopper. I think most people would know that, but I just didn't want uh, being confused as to what has power was. My refrigerator gotcha, has power. This is for has whopper. That must've been uh, spell correct. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, so anyway, CAT3 cleaning um, does require the disinfecting of all non-porous and cleaning and sanitizing of all porous surfaces. What's a little bit different with this enhanced cleaning is we clean walls up to eight feet, meaning anywhere anybody can touch. Um, it does exclude ceiling tiles. Uh, we do a combination of high touch cleanup and enhanced cleanup. Uh, within a structure based on where an infected individual has traveled or may have occupied. And uh, this does require some more man hours as well as equipment and chemicals for that type of cleaning. Of course, uh, when it comes to cleaning, safety first. This is the proper gear we are talking about in regards to PPE. In a CAT1, um, typically, it's an N95 respirator mask, nitrile gloves, and goggles. Again, at ServPro, we've been extra cautious, and I think all of our employees have been suiting up in the full PPE um, just to be protected in all cases. CAT 2 and 3 includes half or full face respirators with P100 filters. Uh, we, the recommendation is gloves, two, two different pairs of gloves at two different colors, four mil and five mil. And this is recommended uh, for tear detection. If your employees are wearing two gloves and they cut through one, but their second glove is, is protected and, and intact, you're, you're safe to know that it had not penetrated to the skin surface. Coveralls uh, with attached hood and boots uh, and with a storm flap over the zipper. And then as you see in the picture there, duct tape to secure gloves and the coveralls. If you're using a half mask respirator, eye protection needs to be included uh, in a face shield or goggles. We'll talk now about the chemicals and products um, to be used. Currently there are about 250 registered products on the EPA website uh, that are listed uh, for use in disinfectants against uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, anybody can go here, anybody can check it out. And I'm gonna show you what you need to look for on products you may already have in your inventory. This is literally a screenshot or a picture I took with my phone off of a bottle of Serve Pro Oxide, which is our number one go-to for cleaning. And you can see uh, right where, I don't know, does my now, mouse work on this, Danielle? Can you, uh, yeah, okay. So right here you see the EPA registration number and it's usually right next to the barcode area. Uh, this is what you wanna look at to make sure the product you're using. Um, again, we live in times where people try to promote products and cures and say, oh, my new oil will kill anything. Uh, go to the EPA, look for the numbers, look on the products you have and see if it has been registered. And do know, this is not an endorsement by the EPA. This is what criteria they're using based on other viruses and how they work and how they, they kill. And here's a list of some other products that we use at Serve Pro uh, for different types of cleanings that are also listed on the EPA website. Uh, getting a little bit into some of the equipment, uh, this is specific to what we use, um, hydroxyls. These, these are my favorite pieces of equipment that we have because they, they actually look really cool when they're turned on. Um, but using green technology, hydroxyls um, purify air pretty much. The, they, the decontaminating contents and surfaces are affected as well, um, as well as stubborn odors. Um, you know, biohazard cleaning has, is not new to SurfPro. I've actually gone on sites for um, biohazards in uh, unattended deaths, and the, the odor is tremendous. And, and a piece of equipment like this just is amazing. And I am not an electrical engineer, but the takeaway from this is basically when you plug them in, they have lamps and a screen that basically um, mixes with water and oxygen in the air to create free electrons and hydroxyl radicals. And that decomposes and eliminates organic and inorganic gases and air pollutants. This is something that is a great a piece of equipment that's great for restaurants, grocery stores, assisted living, airports, hotels, movie theaters, offices. Um, this is equipment based on availability that we also do rent out. Um, this is something that, you know, something like assisted living, and it's very effective to use in the hallways and spaces um, that industry is being hit. And Mike, I think you want to interject something? No? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the next piece of equipment that is uh, very popular is the fogger. Some people call it a mister. And basically it's a deodorizer and a disinfectant, depending on the chemical that you actually use in it. Uh, the takeaway here, um, without going into the very details of it, is that because of its flexible hose, our workers and employees are capable of reaching places high up, low, underneath desks, behind chairs, and it sprays a fine mist on everything. Some of our clients have had us come out to fog and then had their regular janitorial staff do a cleaning afterwards and actually did a wipe down of all that misting of the uh, disinfectant. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I did wanna to touch base a little bit on HVAC because as we do prepare to open businesses, I guarantee that employees are gonna be concerned about this. Uh, this hasn't even started to be a topic yet, but people are gonna be concerned about recir recirculated office air. And a lot of times companies don't pay a lot of attention into, to their HVAC ducts until they have a problem. This is just something I want everybody to think about. When's the last time your duct cleaning was done? And this is not currently a SARS-CoV-2 cleaning protocol. This whole presentation was designed for business owners that are thinking about what they need to do to reopen their business. This is one of the things I think you need to consider and you need to take a look at. If your ducts have not been cleaned in a year, they should be cleaned professionally. And again, you're offering that level of security to your employees that here's what I've done to ensure our office, our business is as safe and healthy as possible. Um, as I mentioned, I spoke with Brian Yeekel over at Penn Stainless 
And this is about a 10 minute little video clip, which will be a, a nice break in between two segments as well. So I am going to play that for you here. And I'll be back after the video. Hi, we're uh, here with Brian Yagle. Uh, Brian is the plant manager at New Salem uh, here in Weaver Town. And we have been doing a lot of work for him um, in his warehouse and office space. So I wanted everybody to have a first-hand kind of look from um, a business in the area that you can relate to. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we spoke earlier, but I, I wanted to go through a couple of questions uh, about this pandemic and your experience having served for Oak Mountain Clean. Um, so let's start with, you know, in the beginning, let's go back to the beginning. The viruses uh, start and we, we start to go into somewhat of a panic mode and you start calling around to uh, businesses just to get an understanding of pricing and what you needed to do. Uh, from a professional perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us about that initial experience when you know those first calls to companies and what specific criteria you look for in helping you make a decision on what company to go with? Sure. Um, obviously we were looking to add to the cleaning of our facility and uh, the well for the well-being of the employees looking for options to get the building clean, get certain common areas to clean for sure, the offices, restrooms, locker rooms, those type things. So pretty much at the end of March, started to reach out to a couple different cleaning places, uh, local places, uh, national places. Um, you know, we felt along the way that, um, you know, there, there, was, there, was no, there was no harm in doing more than doing less. So as we went through, uh, called a couple different places, everybody was very busy. You know, panicking, you could hear on the phone when they were on the other end of the line, kind of scrambling, gave you very little bit of time on the phone. Uh, may had a couple commitments that fell through from uh, a national national cleaner and reached out to Serve Pro, I think, on March 26th. And this was about a week before we really started to invest in the cleaning. And that was uh, a very good phone call and I found other people kind of short with me on the phone. Uh, I could tell they were kind of understaffed and they didn't take time to talk to people. Surf Pro did. Uh, very, very surprised at how much time they took with me on the phone, explained everything. They also have three different tiers, which I'm sure she'll explain to you, but um, explained those over the phone, sent me an email with the phone, MSDS sheets for all the cleaning material and supplies right at first hand so we could see what the products actually were and what the benefits of the project of, of the products were and um, so that's where it kind of started with the serve pro relationship with us and us being really honestly a first-time customer of serve pro uh, the response was really good given the circumstances that they were working under okay, thank you i'm glad you had a good experience uh, when you originally contacted us it was more so for that proactive what we call category one type of cleaning. Uh, but then you had a positive diagnosed case with one of your employees, so that had elevated it to a category three cleaning for us. Um, can you talk a little bit about that situation and the overall transition from proactive and that sense of urgency and, and how the response was and the change from category one to category three? Sure. So the category one, that first off, was really simple. I think I called on a Wednesday and I was able to schedule a category one cleaning of the common areas and office areas for that Saturday. And that came in and that was done. The next Sunday is when we found, um, we, were, we were notified of a positive case that had been out in the shop. And we actually, as a company, we took some proactive steps to actually hold operations at that point uh, to get the shop clean for the day. So I had placed a call that Sunday evening uh, to the serve pro line. I had to call the 1-800 number, but then they put me in direct contact with the person that was on call in the Upper Bucks County serve pro. And I was able to schedule an appointment for 11 o'clock the next morning to have them come out. Um, I can't say enough about the serve pro crews when they come here, whether it was the category one or the category three that we did out in the shop. Um, they're always early um, and sometimes 
even an hour early. Um, here they're ready to go. They went out in the shop and that category three clean is a very impressive clean. Us being a 185,000 square foot facility that processes stainless steel, we have all different types of equipment. So you're talking about, you know, you're not talking about just desks that were cleaning. You're talking about pointing at forklifts and they go and clean it. You're talking about pointing at uh, big, heavy industrial shears and they go and clean it. And it's not just the high touch surfaces. They focus on the high touch surfaces, but they go as high as somebody can reach from the ground up, up to, you know, approximately seven to eight feet, depending on the version of the machine, to really wipe it down and clean the area. Um, at the same time, then, we extended the Category 3 clean into all the common areas, too. Again, our locker room, our lunchroom, our time clock areas. Um, any area where we do the employee was and any other any area where the employee might have been, uh, they were directed to, no questions asked. They clean them. They work safely, and they're very conscientious. Really can't stand up about the crews when they do show up. There's typically a team leader. That team leader identifies himself right away, and then this point, they basically clean it. Great. Uh, so, how is your employee doing, by the way? Uh, the, the employee's doing. The employee's doing well. Um, this we're 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 now sitting approximately two and a half weeks, three weeks since that initial positive, and he's doing well. He's recovered. Um, and he'll be returning back to us next week. That's wonderful to hear. That's so great to hear. And when you and I spoke earlier in the week, you had mentioned that. You had heard from other businesses that had positive diagnoses and then a bigger spread. And you mentioned to me that since we did that cleaning right after, you had no other infections. Is that correct? Sure. I mean, that's that's one of the things that we're very proud of right now. And um, this game's not over. So I say this with a little bit of uh, trepidation, but. Between, between the halting of operations and the cleaning that was done. And the cleaning, of course, at Surfro, I give Surfro a lot of credit. You'll be impressed with, if anybody would be impressed with the, even the cat one cleaning of the fogging. Fogging saturates areas. Uh, it goes up into the air, it comes down and it lays on all surfaces. You can see that being done. Um, we also, you know, we also do our regular cleaning too. You know, of course, we have cleaning supplies are tough. Those of you that are going to be coming back online, you know, cleaning supplies, aerosol sprays, cleaners, you have to have them because regardless of everything you have going on, you have to keep it as clean as you can. So those efforts we did, along with Surf Pro coming in, I, I you know, you, you have heard too many stories about employers that had one case. Uh, may not have followed along with the right guidelines, may not have contacted people to let them know. And that one case turned into eight, and then the next week, 10. Um, so I'm happy to say that between the serve pro cleaning, the quickness of their response coming out and cleaning it, that we still have no new cases that have come up. Some employees did go get tested after that first case, you know, just based upon the information that they knew, calling to contact their doctors when they got tested. But um, all those tests came back negative at this point. So right now we're in a good spot. And that is due to as a company us reacting to it, notifying people, letting them know, but then also the cleaning processes that were done. Great. That's great to hear. Um, you know, recently Governor Wolf um, has presented his plan for slowly opening businesses back up. And part of this entire presentation that this video is for is uh, to help other Upper Bucks County businesses prepare for that and start to plan what they need to do in addition to just cleaning. Um, but is there anything else that you would like to add uh, that you can share with your, your business neighbors um, on what they should consider with reopening from anything that you may have learned since you were an essential business that has been open this entire time? Sure. I mean, Obviously, get up to speed on the policies um, that are in place. The you know the government care acts that were put in, um, knowing how to relate to the, the employees. Uh, it's going to be interesting for companies that have been closed that haven't been working through it. As employees come back, um, you know you're you're really going to have and we share that same that same effect. Now you have to keep people safe, um, but you also have to 
keep saying in terms of having questions, having the answers to the questions they're going to have come back. And there's going to be a lot of them. Um, you know, some people are going to come back, they're going to feel it's too early that they shouldn't come back for various reasons. And by keeping them safe through the procedures that you're, you have in your facility on cleaning, um, and then also being very up to speed on the policies that are in place now, having that information be ready for those questions because they're going to come and you need to have the answers for them. Right, right. That's one part of it. And going forward, you know, we did our, our CAT 3 cleaning for you, but you do have us on regular rotation right now. Um, do you just want to touch base on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I, I, basically, we, you know, since, since, since April, I think it was the 5th, if that was a Saturday, I've had Surf Pro in every Saturday hitting our office areas, common areas in the shop. And also doing work out in the shop in just different areas. We kind of just hover around the shop cleaning areas. Um, that's done, and that's scheduled out through the end of May at this point. We've committed to that because the, the, the value in that of not just the cleaning, which is the most important value that's added in that, making sure you're keeping people safe, but also the um, also, just the employees knowing that you are taking those steps, you are keeping the areas clean, you're making that investment in their in their well-being. You know, a lot of times I, I hear people say safety, and it is safety, but it's really more employee well-being. And what we found is the definition of employee well-being has kind of changed over during this uh, during this crisis because, of course, you have to take the health, not one to get sick. Um, but also indicators that happen during other sickness. If somebody has an earache, they have a temperature. You know, so keeping other viruses and other bacteria out of the facility is important. Otherwise, you know, somebody could somebody could get sick with a common cold, yet they could be showing symptoms of the, the COVID virus and therefore being out of work, potentially quarantined for 14 days or until a test result comes back. So keeping everybody health is important. But also, also their well-being, because um, you know those of us that are are in business and working through it, and those that are outside of work wanting to come back, and in some cases really wanting to come back to work. Uh, you know, well-being is also business continuity through the process, and of course after the process, when those new businesses come back online, you know you're going to want to get back to all your customers and service them. You need your employees healthy to do that on the on the back side of it. Right, right. Yeah, there's something about feeling a lot of security with what's going on and, and making sure the buildings that you're entering feel safe in. So, Brian, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining us today for the Upper Bucks Chamber of Commerce and all the businesses in Bucks County. And uh, please stay safe and healthy. And we're so glad to be of service to you. Very welcome. Thank you very much. Take care. Hi, we're oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so that was Brian Yeagle from um, Penn Stainless. Um, so now let's go on to phase two here of the post-pandemic planning. Uh, these are environmental changes to office spaces and businesses for our new norm. Um, one thing to keep in mind, over the last four dec decades, Americans' personal space at work has steadily shrunk. Um, we're going, again, it's going to be a new world when we go back. And again, like Brian even said, your employees' well-being and knowing that they're going into an environment that they are comfortable with. Um, but the last six weeks, the COVID-19 pandemic has fast-forwarded our future as much as a decade. We are all telecommuting. We're all using Zoom. We've had kids in the background. My dog has barked more than once. And if my doorbell rings today, you'll hear my dog bark. And this has become a common understanding practice for us all. And everybody um, is being productive and being efficient. So as your employees prove their competence working remotely, they will also grow less tolerant of workplaces that fail to promote their health and their well being. That is a new reality that you really need to consider. We created this back to work 
work guide um, as a key to help creating and enforcing um, a healthy and safe work environment. Uh, one, before reopening your business, provide your entire building or office a thorough cleaning as everything we've just discussed in category one, two, and three and the different cleaning guides. But adjust your cleaning schedule and protocols. Uh, if your business is a smaller business and right now you have a cleaning company that comes once a week, you may want to change that. You definitely need to take a look at your cleaning schedule and protocol. You have to develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. You need to create or reconfigure your space to encourage better hygiene. And we're going to go through this with some details and tips on how to do that. You're going to need to mark six foot personal space. We've, we've all been in the grocery stores and we all have looked down at the floor and it says stand here and it's six feet spaced apart. And there's a reason behind that. You'll need to make adjustments to touch points. You'll need to do uh, something for the directional traffic. And I have a, a little map that I can show you that can be created for any floor plan that can help label directional traffic. Most importantly, you need to create your business's roles and you need to communicate those roles. You need to tell your workers this is their new norm and this is what is expected of them and this is what you will provide them to be healthier and and uh, well their well-being taken into consideration and lastly you need to learn to be flexible and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, regarding your cleaning schedules and protocols as i mentioned you might want to increase your janitorial staff or third-party professional certified rest restoration cleaners you might want to increase that. You might want to add that once a week. As Brian mentioned, we're coming out every Saturday just to do fogging. Uh, you do want to increase your cleaning levels to not just be general cleaning, but to include disinfecting. As I mentioned, you might want to add the weekly fogging or the deep cleaning to your program. You might want to consider your HVAC cleaning. Definitely look at your records to see when the last time your HVAC was cleaned. And it's important that you ask your employees to declutter their desks. Uh, people are used to spending 40 plus hours in their office space. They have pictures, they have knickknacks, they have momentums. Ask them to take them home um, to just keep the absolute necessities on their desks going further forward. In regards to developing an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. This is all from OSHA. These are just excerpts that you can absolutely go to OSHA.gov and take a look for yourself. But um, if you don't already have a plan in place, you need to develop an infectious disease preparedness and response plan. Um, you want to, again, look at federal, state, tribal, territorial health agencies and consider how to incorporate those recommendations and resources into your workplace. Every business is different. So this will be custom to your business and your needs. Such considerations do include, you need to consider your employees where, how, and to what sources of SARS-CoV-2 might they be exposed. You have to consider the general public, the customers you have coming into your space, coworkers. And then you need to cons consider sick individuals or those um, a particularly high risk of infection. These are, if you have workers that are international travel, travelers, healthcare workers, um, as well as anybody suspected of having COVID-19, you need a plan on how you will react to that. You also need to consider non-occupational risk factors at home and in community settings. You need to consider the worker's individual risk factors. Do you have people that are older or have chronic medical conditions, um, in, in immunocompromising conditions or pregnancy? All those things you need to consider about each individual worker and they should be addressed in your, your infectious disease response plan. And then the controls necessary to address each and every one of those risks. Uh, situations that may arise as a result of outbreaks that you need to consider now. You're going to have an increased rate of worker absenteeism. Somebody that is 
getting sick, like Brian even mentioned, it could be a coming cold, but what is your business's plan to react to that? What do you have in place for that? Again, the need for social distancing. Can you stagger work shifts? Can you downsize certain operations, delivery services remotely, and other exposure reducing measures? Um, options for conducting essential operations with a reduced workforce, including cross training. Can you know, again, this is the new norm going forward. You need to look at your entire business operation and, and decide how you can best operate under these circumstances. You have to address interrupted supply chains and delayed deliveries. Plans should also consider and address uh, the steps the employers can take to reduce the risk of worker exposure, um, including developing policies and procedures for prompt identification and isolation of sick people. You need to develop, implement, and communicate about your workplace flexibilities and protections. You need to implement workplace controls and you need to follow existing OSHA standards. When talking about creating a six foot workspace to promote better hygiene and social distancing, again, that six foot is a CDC recommended measurement. In an office situation, uh, typically right now in 2020, most offices are an open concept. Um, there aren't walls, there aren't offices, they, they, people have their space. Right now, I anticipate you're going to see a complete revamp of office supply companies and what they're going to be promoting. You're going to see six foot round carpets. You're going to see things that can mark spaces and signs that can help you secure your office more effectively. In a pinch, duct tape can mark those areas, but you definitely want to make this part of your rules of staying within a six foot social distancing space. Also, there's the closed concept. This was very popular in the 90s um, where everybody had their little cubicles and people feel safe. And this might be a way for you to address your office situation. Do you go back to cubicles and smaller workspaces that are less trafficked? So in regards to touch point adjustments, um, you need to make permanent adjustment, adjustments, but I know we may be reopening businesses very shortly, in a few short weeks. And again, with your employees being nervous about coming back to work and every workplace being different, these are some suggestions that we came up with. So the touch points we'll go over. So doors, as a permanent fix, automatic doors are gonna be the way of the future for workspaces, but that's also very costly and very expensive. An alternative to that, to that is swinging doors with kick plates. Again, you won't be using your hands to open them. A temporary fix would be removing doors. Obviously, you can't remove doors to restrooms or places like that, but you can remove inner office doors that aren't necessary, and that would eliminate any touch points and the ability to spread the virus. Kitchen appliance, appliances, it's very common for businesses to have big kitchens, big communal refrigerators where everybody puts their lunch in, everybody shares it. Um, you're gonna need to eliminate company-wide uh, kitchens and utilize individual or smaller, smaller appliances. I envision companies replacing those larger work kitchens with smaller personal little refrigerators for desks or under desks. Um, again, this is a cost that your business might not be prepared to take on. So in the meantime, a temporary fix is to close your kitchen. Uh, people will understand that they need the brown bag, they need to go out for lunch, whatever that may be, but you need to consider just closing a communal kitchen down. Or if you have cubicles and you have smaller spaces, if you can create an area that's a mini kitchen for just those workers in that cubicle area. Um, again, the less bodies in one place, the better. For bathrooms, again, you can't take down the doors, but you can install sanitizing stations or dispensers in all stalls, next to sinks, on the outside of the doors. This should be a practice actually that you can do throughout your entire business. Temporary fix is the same, um, as well as increased cleaning. Uh, for desks, you should be providing disposable desk pads. Uh, my last Google search hasn't shown that they are available yet. They are being made though, where you, they 
come in almost like a large pizza box and you can put them at your entrance and an employee can grab one, take it to their desk and put it down, keeping their area clean. And at the end of the day, they can crumple it up and throw it away. In a pinch right now, um, you can use something like that um, wrapping paper, that construction type of um, industrial paper that comes on a roll, staples, uh, Amazon, they all sell it. You could put that at your entrance. People can just tear off the piece they need to put onto their desk. And then in regards to desktop phones, um, I anticipate we're gonna see that voice activated communication devices will be our new norm. In the meantime, a temporary fix is to have people use their, their cell phones and forward all calls there so that they are the only one using that phone. And again, overall promote a minimalistic workspace. As I mentioned a little bit earlier about directional movement, um, the CDC uh, recommends that people go one way, just like driving. And this could be clockwise or counterclockwise. Counterclockwise is more convenient because it's stay to the right, typical of what we're used to in driving. And as you see by this map that I created, if I was entering the building over, there's my mouse over here and coming into that reception area, but my destination was the conference room, I would not come in and just make an immediate left because the directional signs would lead me completely around the office to go through the indoor. All of this needs to be labeled and adjusted accordingly. The supermarkets have moved to that already. Supermarkets, right. yeah, they're doing that already. Right. Um, in regards to signs, help people to remind them, you know, your six foot safe zone, stop right here, one way. Again, these are gonna become very common on office supply stores. You're gonna be seeing everything for directional signage available probably pretty soon. You know, don't be afraid to say stop authorized personnel in places that you normally would not have done before. Also definitely, you know, include signage about, you know, typical hygiene that people need to be reminded of. Again, signs, signs, everywhere signs. Reminds me of that song. <laughs> Again, it's really important that your employees know what you're doing and what's expected of them. Um, so you should create your rules and this will take time to think about and put into place, but this is a sample rule list that I put together. But you, know, you wanna be positive, be welcome at work, but always act responsibly. Remind people of that. Stick to the rules, follow the signs. This will be new to people. This will be odd to people. People will be scared, but they need to know these are the new rules. Stay safe at six feet from each other. Walk the office counterclockwise everywhere. Enter and leave meeting rooms as indicated. Replace your desk pad daily and leave a clean dry desk. So these are just a, a sample rules that you could create. You could print out yourself or you can have them printed at a professional printer. And lastly, we want to talk about being flexible, like Brian from uh, Penn Stain Stainless mentioned is, you know, the workers are, are not all going to be comfortable coming back as, as much as we can't wait to go back to that office setting. Everybody's going to be cautious. And as an employer, you want to be flexible. Uh, this quote I love, but the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is fear of the unknown. I started this presentation talking about all of the unknowns and we are in the middle of it. The best thing you can do is be empathetic, be positive. Definitely wanna be positive. Um, you wanna acknowledge people's fears, not ignore them. You wanna be accepting of their concerns and their fears, have a new open door policy for all of that. Um, help reduce stress. I was on a call the other day where a company started doing a, a yoga and meditation lunch hour virtually to help reduce stress for their employees. Um, maybe that's something you incorporate back in your office environment where you know for 15 minutes after lunch, everybody's going to do a, a nice, round table of meditation and or even talking. Offer your assurance that you know you are there to listen to their concerns. And most importantly, communicate your plan. That's the most important thing that you can take away from this today. And that's pretty much it 
for the presentation and now we can open it up to questions and Daniel, right. I don't, I don't see chat. So that's all right. I've been uh, taking notes. So if I seem like I'm disinterested, it's, it wasn't the case. Um, just been taking notes on um, some of our questions. We have about nine. So I'll start with the first one. It um, asks, is there a certification for trainers to train others on proper PPE use? Um, and um, can you provide contact information for train the trainers certification? And that is something that we can follow up afterwards. Um, we can communicate uh, that type of information website. Um, I, uh, just uh, so I'm a member of multiple organizations. ABC East is um, Association of Builders and Contractors. They're offering for $75 um, a training course. Um, and I, I believe it will review PPE as well. I'm also a, an OSHA instructor. So if you have, um, if you go to OSHA.gov and you go, you can search for instructors. Um, I'm sure that you'd be able to set up a, um, just a PPE segment of like in the OSHA 10 hour and the 30 hour um, general industry and construction, there is a whole lesson on PPE. So they could probably do something like that. And while we were doing this, I was thinking, um, um, Danielle, maybe we could do something like this where I do a live donning and doffing of personal protective equipment, the different levels that people would use in, um, yes, the different, <laughs> he wanted a Coke. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> that's been an easy yes this last month and a half. Um, but yeah, so you could, we could maybe do a virtual PPE um, course. I agree, Mike. I wrote down the same thing. Something that just shows a video doesn't have to be uh, too intense. I mean, if you want to do a little light dancing or some kind of choreographed thing, I think that would be really helpful. I but was going to I was going to wear a thong and <laughs> just kind of go from there. But all right. Now we're now we're getting crazy. No, that would uh, that would be good. We'll we'll work on that on a side note and maybe put together some kind of uh, video for that. Um, the second question, um, Robin, is are the Serpro products that you mentioned, the cleaning products, um, I think one of them you said it was kind of your go-to product, are they sold to anyone? Are they available for purchase or is it just cleaning products that only Serpro uses? At, um, yep, I got this one too. There's companies called John Don. Um, there's a company called Shapers, S-C-H-A-P-E-R. Um, they sell to our industry. So you might be able to, you probably, it might be difficult. They're probably going to restoration contractors first. Um, I don't think we would be opposed to selling the product. Um, but the problem is right now we need the product uh, to do the cleanings and you do need specialized training on applying it. Um, I see videos all the time of somebody wearing a mask, but no, no uh, goggles or they're wearing gloves, but no mask or goggles, and they're doing their own misting. Um, that's pretty dangerous because they're inhaling that mist, and that's just awful. Um, so there really would need to be some sort of a training before I would mm -hmm. feel comfortable with selling anything. But I can always check with our stock. I know we just picked up two 55-gallon drums of the BioEsk. Um, that's another product that we found to be highly effective, um, very Odor neutral. I know somebody asked a question about that. Um, very odor neutral, very non-toxic, but yet toxic in the way that it needs to be as a disinfectant. Yeah, so maybe we'll just jump to that question. Um, uh, one of our employers locally is a wellness center and they have clients who are sensitive to cleaning products, some of those harsh chemicals. Um, do you have recommendations for a more natural cleaner or disinfectant? Like I said, BioEsk is what we use, um, as, as well as the Sporo, the Serpro Oxide, which is um, very um, environmentally neutral. Um, but as far as over the counter or something like that, I don't. The, the safest bet is EPA.gov. They have an N list, N as in Nancy, an N list. And that is for all of the cleaners that Robin had mentioned. There's over 200 of them that. Um, that apply. One of the things that my instructor yesterday on my trauma and crime scene cleaning uh, course, he suggested when you go out to these lists, 
you're not looking at brand names. You're looking at active ingredient. You're looking at the, the, the ingredient that does the disinfecting. If you then cross-reference that through Google or through a visit to your Home Depot or local Ace Hardware, you may or probably will be able to find a product that contains that percentage of active ingredient and you'll be able to pick it up much cheaper. Okay, great. Um, this one says, where do you rent or buy hydroxyls? Hydroxyls are about $2,000 a pop. Um, John Don, Shapers, companies like that sell them. Um, renting them is not something that I'm aware that anybody that like the, the larger um, United Rentals and things like that, I don't believe they're renting them. If somebody wants to contact me offline, um, we probably would be able to do something for you. We do have an overabundance of them. We bought them um, last year for they had nothing to do with this, more for when we do unattended deaths, suicide cleanups, things like that, and then heavier mold projects. It just so happens that they're being highly recommended for this type of environment now. So, um, yeah, we could probably figure something out, especially if it's, you know, I saw some of the people are working in, they have, you know, um, um, what was it? I lost my notes, but one of the you know, running homes and things like that, so. Okay, and we'll, Mike, we'll provide uh, you and Rob, you, your email and Robin's email um, along with the PowerPoint when people have. Okay, that. and but then I'm going to jump just because it's in my way here. Somebody said regarding temporary desk pads, would the paper used in doctor's offices be adequate? Yes, it would. Um, this is also, we are big seafood eaters in my house and I have a large island. So <laughs> this is the paper that Robin was talking about. It's kind of like trash bag. I'm not trash bag. Well, I'm, supermarket bag paper but it comes on a on a big roll a much bigger roll than this we use it quite often and we use it for all kinds of things we use it for arts and crafts with the kids we use it for seafood um so that's the type of paper in a pinch that robin was talking about and i was gonna say that's a lot of seafood dude i yeah. mean that's a big roll yeah well, you guys we like let's it. go all out crawfish a couple times in the summer <laughs> and crab legs and yeah um the next question I have is, what's the best way to disinfect playground equipment? The best way to disinfect it is there, to wipe down all the touch points with the EPA registered disinfectant. That would be the, and kids, don't look at it from your perspective, look at it from kids' perspective. I've looked out my window and I've seen my children um, on top of the roof of the, of the playground uh, because it was wood and they thought it was a good idea. Um, so again, that you might never have thought to clean up there, but they will get up there. So they're all the touch points that the kids could have contact with. I would recommend the misting Avenue. You mist it all down really well and then do a general cleaning, like a soapy water wipe down of the surfaces. That would probably be the most effective. Okay, great. Um, do you have examples of reactive measures to positive cases in the workplace or facility? Cat three, cat three cleaning. That's that, you know, what, just what uh, Brian from Penn Stainless talked about. He had us do the category one, which was just the misting. They had a confirmed case and um, then he moved to the category three, which is all touch points, walls up eight feet. That's reactive. Um, so, and just to mention, um, we have been doing this for 18 years. I've never had anyone go out due to be exposure to a virus. Um, and during the last month and a half, we have been continuously working. My employees are on a staggered shift in the office. Marketing's working from home and all of my guys come in every day. They social distance. They um, attend the, the regular work in progress meeting, but they stay six feet away from each other. The communication has never been better. Spirits are great. They go out and they do this work. They do it gladly because they know they're helping. And even though we were in Penn Stainless before they had the confirmed virus, then they had the confirmed virus. The same guys were able to go because they had worn proper protective equipment and they weren't infected. So that's mm -hmm. really good news. We have that had is, two. We have had two different people think that they might have had it. They took the 14 days off, um, and they came back. They never had it. Okay. 
Do you recommend having a quarantine period for physical items um, that people bring to a facility? So this example was um, someone works in the library and if people are bringing things in, do you recommend quarantining um, physical items? So like if they return a library book or something to that effect? Yes. I, right now, the CDC guidance is really, it's not their fault, it's really weak on dwell times. So mm -hmm. on how long things last and live on surfaces. Um, one of the things that I found is, it is not certain how long the virus that causes COVID-19 sur survives on surfaces, but it seems to behave like other coronaviruses. Studies suggest that coronaviruses, including preliminary information on the COVID-19 virus, may persist on surfaces for a few hours or up to several days. This may vary under different conditions, the type of surface, the temperature, or the humidity. If you think a substance may be infected, clean it with simple disinfectant to kill the virus and protect yourself and others. Clean your hands with an alcohol-based hand rub or wash them with soap and water. So a couple of examples of items is, number one, you gotta love Faber's. Faber's is selling this stuff. I got mine at, um, I got this at Landis for $8.99, but I have bought it for as low as $5.99 at, um, at um, Hennings. I have little spray bottles. I bought them online at Amazon. I just use a funnel, I fill it up, and I spray my hands down a lot. My kids, 7, 9, 11, and 18, all have their own bottle. They're always using it. That's, and they're always washing their hands. I'm going through dish soap like you wouldn't believe, but they're doing everything they can. Um, something else that I picked up because we all have them is an ultra, uh, uh, ultraviolet light um, box. I was hoping to be able to clean my masks with it, but I'm not if they just don't fit in here right, but it works, it's highly effective for phones. And just so you know, there's a, um, a device that we use called a luminometer. The luminometer um, takes ATP samples. Um, I forget what ATP means right now because there's 80 people looking at me, but um, it's basically a swab. They crack it open and then they use the swab on a surface, put it in the luminometer. The luminometer will tell us how contaminated that area is. It's not going to tell us what's there. It's just going to pick up on skin cells and things like that. It's going to tell us how high the readings are. Then when we clean, we test again, and that tells, at least shows a reduction in soil, you know, um, dirt on the surfaces. So um, I used one, I put my phone in, I put, before I put my phone in, I used one, and I put it in this, dramatically reduced it, brought it well below industry standards. So I picked this up, surprisingly, this came very quickly. It took a month for me to get a bottle of, uh, of um, vanilla um, <laughs> off of there. But when I ordered this, I got it within two days. So I ordered one for me and one for the office. Cannot hear you, woman. Sorry. It's your husband in the background, right? It's, you had to mute him. It's my daughter. She's about to try to make uh, something. So I'm like, don't do it. Um, in regards to PPE, for cleaning with suits, what is the best suit that's being worn? Is it the basic uh, Tyvek suit? And do you know of a provider who has suits available in stock? ASTM F1671. That is the suits that we're wearing. And they seem to be, when I looked yesterday, pretty widely available online. I can and do that, that again. That, um, Alpha, that Sigma, Tyler, Mike, <laughs> F1671, F1671, coverall, mm -hmm. and they're everywhere. Um, Granger, MSC, um, let's see, uh, Critical Tool, yeah, they're everywhere, Duluth Trading, so that's the one that I recommend, and you go big. So if you think you would be a large, get an XL. I would wear a 2XL. You want it to be loose fitting, but not hanging off of you. That way when you tape the wrists and you tape, you don't want to, you don't want to tape the feet. So you want to wear a, um, um, a booty, but you want to wear a higher end booty. This booty is um, 
um, it doesn't absorb liquid. So you want to put that on and basically what you want to do is before you put that on, you just want to put a rubber band around the ankle. That way it will hold it in place. It'll stop you from shifting around, but it's one less thing that you have to doff when you, you know, with tape around it. Um, and if you get any of the suits that don't have the storm flap, you want to put a piece of tape from there down. Another quick tip is if you're doing this, you're going to want to take a paper clip a large paper clip and attach it to the top, to the zipper. Because the last thing you wanna do is be touching yourself anywhere in that area, fumbling for the zipper. If you have something large there, it makes it real easy to pull it off. And there's great videos online on how to don and doff um, your, um, your PPE. There's a very specific way of doing it, double gloves and, and rolling it down. Google it, you'll find some really good stuff. Okay, and um, so far I think the last question that I have, I'm just trying to get back to it. Um, this one says, suggestions for us, question mark. We're a residential property management. That's what we have saying. all of our common areas closed with the exception of the laundry room. All employees are social distancing, alternative working remotely where, uh, where possible. Um, so what I guess would be your feedback on a residential property management? Well, they have everything, all the common areas closed. Um, employees distancing, which is great. I highly encourage. Um, alternate, alternative work remote, yeah, working. Um, you know, I don't really, unless they have a specific concern, the laundry room would concern me just because of the coming and going. I would limit the amount of people in there at one time, depending on the size of it. And I would do all touch point surface wiping after each use. Amazing. Well, it's uh, 1220, but, you know, really well time spent. This is great information. Again, Robin and Mike, we appreciate uh, Serve Pro providing all this. We'll email everyone um, the PowerPoint and maybe some uh, email and some websites that were mentioned. Um, if anyone has follow up questions, let us know. And um, hopefully we'll get Mike into a bathing suit and he can do some future videos of putting on PPE stuff. I don't so. think Warren's, Warren's reaction, I don't think I do now. I don't, <laughs> the more clothes, the better, right, Warren? <laughs> well, it's, it's our new norm, I guess. I don't know. We're, we're going to try it, keep things interesting. Well, thank awesome. you again, um, Mike and Robin. We really appreciate you doing a great presentation, a lot of information, a lot of thoughtfulness um, went into that, and, um, and we, we appreciate the time. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks everyone, be safe. Have a great day. Bye-bye. good host we are waiting for everybody to sign off of course this is when you just see if anyone talks bad about you <laughs> <laughs> everybody was muted so <laughs> just kidding. Jesus oh is jesus christ at your house he does stop by sometimes <laughs> I, I heard <laughs> um yeah i think it looked like the high was like 85 yeah, I think it actually was higher than that. Um, so, and then we'll also send it to some people. Sometimes their um, their schedules change, but I know we had a hundred registered. Cool. I think we lost a few, especially after somebody said that it would, when somebody asked in the notes, it wasn't that person, but somebody asked, I got here late. I think it was Warren. I got here late. Will this be forwarded to us? So I think that's when we lost a few people thinking yeah. that they'll just wait till they get it and watch it on their time. Right. Um, and it's hard to find the secret sauce. I was just talking to a couple other chambers this week and they found um, 
45 minutes to an hour is what they're they're seeing is the the best timing so um you know so even for me i have a 12 30 so sometimes people are are just jumping from one webinar or zoom to another so yeah in between so good looks like we lost robin so um <laughs> I think I'll jump off then and go see what damage has been done in my home. All right, Mike. Thanks again so much. Take care. Thanks for doing this, Danielle. I think it was good. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.